demonstrating that commercial office buildings can be green buildings, sustainable with large-scale buildings. I think that changes something. We're not the only ones. There are other firms doing that as well. But I think the few firms that are doing that are raising the bar. Just as in some other aspects defining what a Class A office building is in New York and other cities, I think having a gold level or platinum level office building will redefine what a Class A building truly is. In terms of products, I'm continually amazed by the incredible developments in low-income and some less. The ability to use low iron glass in this kind of employment was unthinkable 10 years ago to a person from Costanza. But also the low-E covers are at the point right now where Tower 1, we may be able to actually eliminate the ceramic thread and achieve the same energy performance as we did in several months recently. And that's something we're working on with a certain glass manufacturer as they develop the new coatings in the lead. Many of the elements I'm speaking about, micro-turbines and other mechanical devices, I think, again, large-scale projects elicit a response to manufacturers like no other. So if we can come in and say, we have a great new idea for new technology, it will help us develop it, there is a leverage there knowing that if a new product is developed, that it will open a marketplace not only in this country, but potentially a marketplace around the world. We don't know what's going on in China right now and how much construction is happening around the world. So if we can be out there communicating to manufacturers, product development teams, what the next generation needs to be from our perspective, we've found, especially working in large-scale, we've found manufacturers more than willing to work with us. Any? Well, it's, the two buildings have a similar constraint, if I can say that. You know, Seven Wall Trade has the content vaults at the base of the building. So it is primarily an opaque base. It has a large entry portal that faces the new park. But we did. We struggled for a long time thinking how to reanimate that street edge, how to make it something spectacular. And I do, I don't know if everybody's gotten out there and hasn't been running much of it, but we've actually developed a lighting system within a metal enclosure that, by day, the metal enclosure itself has an incredible amount of perceptual interest in it. But by night, there is a series of lights, a system of sensors that can identify where you are as you walk by, and lights will follow you. Lights will move around. You can actually start to play the building. You can kind of, and I'm waiting desperately to see people running around and chasing each other and seeing if they can catch themselves or catch the light. At Tower One, the response is going to be certainly much more subtle and subdued. It's adjacent to the moral and living demands of that. But absolutely, a similar issue there of a predominantly opaque base that has to have life in it. It has to be animated. And we're working very hard to produce the materials and some lighting to achieve that. Because this is ostensibly a conversation about sustainable design, but at the same time, you can't escape the fact that sustainable building is a livability. We have to make these cities a great place to be. I'm sorry. I didn't see any of the vision. Is there anything in Tower One like the old location where you could get off the train without having to go outside and get into the tower? It's always been a plan of the Freedom Tower in whatever form it took. But yes, there is an incredibly elaborate and extensive below-grade transportation network and pedestrian system like the old towers. Calatrava, designing the train station itself, is developing that organism below grade. But whether you're taking the NR or whether you're coming in through PATH, yes, the old sites can be connected below grade. Unlike the old World Trade Centers, I would say, however, there's going to be a lot of activity at grade, lots of retail, multiple-story retail in most buildings in order to make it a much more livable place to be as well. Thank you. Thank you.
lay on uh, sort of sharing between aesthetics and security concerns? It seems like in some ways they might conflict, and in other ways they might benefit each other. Yes, uh, it's quite a challenge, as you might imagine. Um, and uh, I think that they, you know, we're looking at that aesthetic security and sustainability. Uh, you know, sometimes there's a, uh, there's a happy coincidence. Uh, for example, uh, several of the trade centers, there's, uh, there's a happy coincidence of uh, security and sustainability, uh, where we've located all the air intakes at the top of the building, and, and put uh, particular filters at the intakes. And that result is the air quality is spectacular on the floors itself. So consequently, from a sustainable standpoint, the, the environment is, uh, is absolutely wonderful in the office space. Uh, on on uh, a freedom tower, uh, the most obvious point about security is the base of the building. And I, I think that one has to take uh, the security concerns as a given. I think one deals with it, one looks at the precedents from the past, uh, whether we look at the Federal Reserve building downtown, uh, we look at various ways of dealing with substan substantially big buildings, and, and look at ways of either breaking down the mass or reflecting light. Um, these are these kind of challenges that we have. I don't think that the uh, security concerns uh, are overwhelming. Uh, I think that some of those technologies that we're dealing with, uh, with the, uh, the curve wall above that opaque base, uh, dealing with uh, new types of uh, climate insulators uh, to protect the uh, glass and make the, uh, the interior uh, resistant to uh, the intrusion, uh, all work. And so it's necessary to maintain the daylight, maintain the tension of the outdoors by using these new technologies. Um, yeah, there is something I, I need to add about, about sustainability in practice right now. And that's the enormous advantage we have with the developing computer tools for visualization and simulation. Uh, because one of the advantages of energy performance and, and the overall benefits to the building uh, that we have now is to be able to design a virtual environment and to be able to uh, to look to optimize the building performance in ways that we've never been able to do before. Can you explain how, how this new design confirms to the, the design guidelines set up by the competition? How does the base conform to the design guidelines? The uh, three or four major components of the design guidelines for the Freedom Tower was that first it was the iconic building and the composition of buildings around the site. Um, its specific location in the northwest corner was also fundamental to the, the guidelines. Um, the height of the building, 1776, um, was fundamental. Um, there's a number of different smaller uh, guidelines that go all the way down to um, development of urban landscape, the plazas, um, glass. I think one of the best, perhaps not necessary, but for the best guideline is that there should, there will, will not be reflective glazing um, around World Trade Center site. Um, those kinds of uh, qualitative uh, guidelines, I think, will really uh, improve the environment uh, of the entire site. Um, there's concerns with reflective building, reflective buildings that, you know, all kinds of um, strong uh, patterns of light would be cast across the memorial, for example. So, uh, Fundamentally, it's height and location. Fundamentally, also from the, the energy consumption standpoint, uh, we need to, as part of the guidelines, exceed the performance of the New York State Energy Code uh, by, by 25%. So that uh, uh, creates some challenges, but it's certainly doable to meet those. Uh, and I'm sorry, I might have misunderstood your question. I was, I was responding to this design guidelines rather than the sustainable design guidelines. Stable design guidelines are a 50-page document that are quite extensive. Um, and an incredible document in that they take lead and make it specific to this site. I've always felt that lead, um, in trouble here, but lead does have a, a bias towards suburban development. And um, Battery Park City, as well as the sustainable development here at World Trade Center, are specific to the high-density urban projects, and I think they're a model, they're, frankly, they're a model for all kinds of um, other cities around the country. You talked about three uh, exemplary projects. Um, I'm interested in 
whether you could tell us uh, an example where a kind of common developer building can actually go in with a new technology and make a change so that a, that a project is more, is greener than it was to begin with. But also, could you tell us of a time when that didn't work? Because so often we hear uh, that these kinds, of, these new technologies can be rejected by people. I'd be interested to see if there's a, a, a difference here, because you don't have to give names. We don't. Well, the latter question is the easier one to answer, I believe, I, when it didn't work. Mm -hmm. so there, there, there is, there's a diminishing misconception that, uh, that uh, uh, STEM design costs a tremendous amount of money. Uh, you know, in fact, you know, if it does add costs, it's certainly in the single digits, uh, in the low single digits. So uh, I'm trying to think of uh, instances where it did not work. Uh, and you know, which have I think of run the mill. I'm interested, I mean, these are exemplary projects that you offered, and I'm just, I, I think that this is three out of what? The SOM is 10,000 buildings, so we have to figure. I'm interested in whether you know, the, the a developer comes with a project and you can make it greener. Right. That would be interesting to hear about. Is there a time when you bring this idea and they say, well, actually, no, we just like to do it conventional old way? That certainly happens, yeah, obviously. Uh, where we would come in and say, well, we can double scan the wall here, we can this analysis, and the client would say, well, no, thank you. Uh, that's why I'm not interested in spending an extra $20 a square foot on the exterior wall. Uh, no thanks, I don't want grass growing on my roof. Uh, you know, these types of things. So, you know, the, there is that kind of resistance periodically. Uh, I think that what we've had to do, and Jeff has pointed out these small moves, and it's very interesting how these kind of like small, um, unobtrusive moves without any kind of grand gestures of, you know, windmills and PV arrays and this sort of thing, yet achieve, uh, achieve the, the overall underlying aims. And I think what we are doing is by these, using these exemplary projects, as you is that we're learning the strategy to be able to integrate this and have uh, the kind of experience to well, you know, we could put these, these uh, micro turbines in the building because it's just wasting the steam energy anyway, so why not recover it? It's a strategy that's, on, that's ongoing. I think we've learned our lessons. I, I actually uh, uh, have a, a one example of um, Time Warner Center that um, you know, we try to do quite a bit at Time Warner Center. And in that case, there wasn't a way to think through the problem of sustainability for a project that complex that was ostensibly a core shell project, broken down amongst seven different con condominium owners. Um, we tried many different ways to do this. We couldn't come up with a way that was compelling for the client, a way that was compelling for the USGBC or anybody. But what it did provoke in us is provoke, it showed us where a problem lied. And, um, and Seven World Trade was actually part of the pilot program for Corn Shell. And you know, if, if we can identi again, identify the problem, we won't be successful in every project, but at least learn from it and find out how to go change it the next time. And in this case, we spent a lot of time with the USGBC saying, okay, when we have another project like this, what can you do for us? How can we start to solve these problems? We need, we need their help in framing this argument for our clients in a way they can understand, in a way they can, they can be successful with it. Thank you. 
there the promise of green where Arctic convinced their clients that they're going to be? Did they make a difference in savings? Well, I speak to the work itself is also involved in that project. And that's the client who is interested in sustainable design. Different than the Green Building Council here, but they have their own standards in South Korea. But it's important to them to seek ways to save energy and to recycle materials and that sort of thing. So we're looking at, let's say, active films on the exterior wall. We're making discussions about electric car replacement, these types of new advances on this type of building because these are significant issues to the clients that we're seeing. Certainly the use of double-skin walls is, in fact, more prevalent overseas than it is here. Although we did design, our Chicago office designed a building in Boston for Manulife, which is a double-skin wall. That's more of the exception here. Overseas, the work that we're doing in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, there's a much wider acceptance of double-skin wall technology. So we do have the ability to go overseas, try out these systems, and learn from them. And our clients can get those benefits. I think it's terrific that instead of using diesel generators, you're using the hydrogen fuel cell. I'm just curious where you're getting hydrogen from. Is it from natural gas that might allow the city to first break it down? It's natural gas. So it's still a fossil fuel? I really like the original design with the wind turbines, using the wind up there. Why isn't it used in the new design? Great question. You know, that design, well, actually, incorporating wind turbines into a high-rise structure depends on, in order to make it economically viable and more than a demonstration project, it depends on finding a way to get the structure in place and not have the wind have to pay for the structure. It's critical. When we developed the first design of the Freedom Tower, the antenna at the top of the building, the presumption there was the antenna, the highest possible of the revenue stream, could afford to build the structure to get it as high as possible. That structure's there to come in and work with a wind energy developer to come in and mount wind turbines on the building, in which they don't have to pay that initial cost. They just have to pay for the cost of the turbine and then pay for its upkeep. It made fabulous financial sense. It worked. It surprised all of us for a while. We actually had multiple wind energy providers knocking on our door wanting to be part of this because it not only was a great demonstration, but it made money. The challenge is paying for that structure, and whether it's incorporated into a facade, whether it's incorporated into 400 feet of open lattice work at the top, you need a way for the turbines to defer the cost of being there. What happened? It was difficult to find a way to 